Tonight's subject is the unalloyed. We all know the unalloyed is the unmixed, the pure, the complete. And you and I are seeking that state, the complete unalloyed. We're making our exodus from this age into another age. And the exodus of man begins when man accepts the God of Israel. If the journey seems long, it's only because the children of Israel, those who have accepted the God of Israel, find it difficult to keep the tent. For the God of Israel is I am. That's his name forever. And when I find it difficult to keep the tents, then the journey seems very long. So here, we're moving from this age into another age, an entirely different age. And we will move when we have completely accepted the God of Israel. And the one who has not accepted it, no matter what he has done, how kind, how generous, how wonderful he is, he doesn't move from this age. Now you can take this on every level of your own being. You and I were made subject unto futility, not willingly, but by reason of the will of him who subjected us in hope. That you and I will be set free from this bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. That is our hope. But while we were subjected to it, and this presence who subjected us disappears from view, he takes up residence in us, and we have to find him. He is the unalloyed, the pure, the unmixed. No child born of woman could cross the threshold that admits to conscious life unaided by the life of God. The Bible speaks of that life of God as the blood of Jesus. We are told the life is in the blood. And one day man will find it. One day this tree, for we are the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and this cloven pine will be ribbon from top to bottom. And the imprisoned spirit set free. Every one of us. But not until we completely accept the God of Israel. And that God of Israel is simply I am. You can start this night from where you are to where you would like to be in this world of Caesar. Laid by the God of Israel. In other words, when you know what you are and you know what you would like to be instead of what you seem to be, you assume I am that. Assuming I am that, or I am it, or I am he, call it what you will, and sleep in the assumption that you are really the being that you would like to be. Sleeping in this state, you move across a bridge of incident that leads you towards the fulfillment of your assumption. But when you forget the tense, and you say, I will be, I was, or in any other way, you delay the journey. And it seems so long only because man in his journey finds it difficult to keep the tents of the God he promised to worship. So Elijah said to the people of Israel, he came near to them, and he said to them, concerning this presence of the I Am, <clears throat> how long 
Will you go limping between two? How long? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. You say you've chosen the Lord as God, the Lord of Israel. Well, then do not start limping between these two opinions. You either choose one and reject the other, or you reject what the, you should take and pick the other. In other words, there is no cause of the phenomena of life outside of your own wonderful human imagination. You are bringing it into being morning, noon, and night. So how long will you go limping between two opinions? If the Lord is God, choose him. If Baal is God, then choose him. And then we turn to the book of Joshua. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Choose this day whom you will serve. As for myself and my household, we choose the Lord. And the people of Israel replied, we choose the Lord. And then Joshua said to them, you are witnesses against yourselves, that you have chosen the Lord. And they replied, we are witnesses against ourselves. And then the journey starts. For the exodus, from this age into that age, or from my present state of consciousness into the state of consciousness that I want to express in this world, depends upon my choice of the God of Israel. So if I choose the God of Israel to guide me, to lead me, and his name is I Am, I may find it difficult to keep the tense and instead of sleeping night after night in the assumption that I am already the man that I would be, I may go to sleep in the belief I will be. That delays it. I may go to sleep in any other kind of belief, but I must, to the best of my ability, not only choose the God of Israel, but remain as faithful as I can to my choice. So tonight you can take anything you want if you choose the God of Israel. And may I tell you, if there's anyone in this audience this night who is an Orthodox Jew, and you think because I say I must choose and you must choose the God of Israel, and you are born into a family who are Jews, that you've already made your choice, you are mistaken. Your concept of God is just as far removed from the God as the Christian's concept of God. They have it out there in space someplace, out in time someplace. The God of which I speak, I speak of your own wonderful human imagination. That's the God. That's the God of Israel. And so you choose him to guide you. So tonight when you know exactly what you want, you sleep in the assumption that you are already the man that you want to be and fall asleep in that state and that state will externalize itself within your world. You either do it or say, I will be that man and delay the process. But may I tell you, you will never reach I will be. You can only reach I am it. And so everyone here Try it. Try this state, for the day is coming that this wonderful tree that we are, and I saw it so clearly in vision, it's just a tree. Many have never returned since they heard me speak of this ancient tree. And here is Blake. I never read him when I had my vision. And when he said, hear the voice of the bard, who present, past, and future seeds, whose ears have heard the holy word that walked among the ancient trees. For the night that I saw the trees, and the night I saw this wonderful vision 
of earth, and it all is like a tree, a number tree. And the eighth chapter of Mark, when the man's eye was opened, he was asked, what do you see? He said, I see men like trees walking. And here they told me in this vision that no one in that state where I was believed for one moment <coughs> pardon me, that anyone could come here and ever return. This to them was death, absolute death. They did not know God's plan to insert himself as you, as me, as everyone in the tree. And then put us through furnaces of affliction, but real furnaces of affliction. <coughs> as we're told in the 48th chapter of the book of Isaiah. I have tried you in the furnaces of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake I do it. For how should my name be profaned? I will not give my glory to another. And so he puts himself as us through the furnaces of affliction. And when we are the unalloyed, pure gold, which is his blood, then comes that pine. The cloven pine is riven from top to bottom. And the imprisoned spirit set free. And may I tell you, when you see it, <coughs> you will know it. You will see this golden glow, and you will say within yourself, I know it is myself, O oh, my divine creator and redeemer. And you will fuse with it, and then rise to the very height. You can't go any higher. You will rise to the very limit as you fuse with this golden liquid light, which is the blood of God. But on this level, the same thing holds good. At all levels, the same principle. And I make my exit from where I am to where I want to be only as I accept the God of Israel. And the God of Israel is I am. That's the God of Israel. I call him by no other name. Just I am. I don't say I am Neville, or I am John, or I am Mary. Just I am. On that I can put anything. I can say I am healthy, wealthy, no, unknown, anything. It's entirely up to me to accept the God of Israel. And then put the mask upon him, for he is the actor. I am is the actor. And the assumption is the mask that the actor wears. That's why I assume that I am, I name it. When I name it, then I rise, moving across a bridge of incident, which leads me to the fulfillment of that which I have assumed that I am. So this is the God of which I speak. And then will come that moment in time when you move from this age into that age. Where everything then is completely subject to your imaginative power. For you are God. You are God now. But you do not know it and you find it difficult keeping the tense. And most of us don't think in terms of the tense. We think in terms of some being outside of God in some strange part of the world, of the universe. So the unalloyed of which I speak tonight, you can write down to this one simple state, I am, not mixed with anything. I don't say I am an American, I am a Russian, I'm a white man, I'm a Negro. I say nothing, just simply I am. That's my God. If I should say to you now, that some Russian is more proud of being a Russian than he is of being I am, you might in some strange way rejoice. But I'll turn it around and ask of the whole vast 190 millions of us, are we more proud of being an American than being Christ? I am is Christ. Are we more proud of being white than being Christ? 
Are we more proud of being, you name it, than being Christ? And Christ is simply, I am. This morning's mail brought a letter, typewritten, unsigned, but a little type perplexed. I can't answer your letter if you're here tonight. He said, you were terribly disturbed last Sunday morning because of what I said. And then you went into all this detail of our country being completely eaten by subversion. But may I tell you, if you are here tonight, imagining creates reality. You couldn't discuss with me either in the letter that you wrote, or verbally, or in any other way, and not create what you discuss. We are incapable of discussing anything as an object that is independent of imagining on some level or levels. You couldn't do it. I tell you, imagining creates reality. There is no fiction in our world. I can sit down here now and imagine something that is not based upon fact. There isn't one fact in the world to support it. And wait, if I am faithful to the God of Israel, for the God of Israel is I am, but I am doing it. And if I know all things are possible to this God that I have discovered, all I need to do is wait, and it's externalized in my world. So when you wrote me this long, detailed, typewritten letter, if you are present, may I tell you, I was perplexed. You signed yours, perplexed. I asked you to share with me your experiences. Now, what I said last Sunday morning to disturb you, I really don't know. I was trying to explain what the creative power of God is. It's called in scripture, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is personified, and we take the personification for a person and go some to sleep. Make some little icon of him and stick it on the wall. Or make some picture of him and put it on the wall. And we think that is Christ. It's not Christ. Christ is the creative power and the wisdom of God. And if those who wrote the story personify this quality, it's perfectly all right. Always bear in mind, it is a personification of a quality, of a power, this creative power of God. And don't worship the personification. It's not a person. Jesus Christ is in you. As though I tell you a mystery, a mystery hidden for ages and generations. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in me is my hope and glory? Yes. But then where is he? Your capacity to imagine. That's he. And all things are possible to him? Yes. Well then test him and see. Come test me and see if I am not the being that I tell you that I am. I am the creative power of the universe. That's what he's telling me. And so I then will test him. I can imagine that I am what at the moment reason denies, my senses deny, everything denies, and if I keep faithful to the tense, I am this, then I will become it? Yes. And if I do become it, will I then forget how it happened? I may. That's the journey that man takes in his exodus from this age to the other age. We're always forgetting and find it very, very difficult to keep the tense. But the journey starts when man is bold enough to accept the God of Israel. And the only God of Israel is I am. If a rabbi should tell you his name is Jehovah, turn. Unless he knows Jehovah means I am. No matter how wise they are, all the ritual and all the ceremony and all the things on the outside, it means nothing. If he doesn't know who the God really is, and that God is simply, I. And if you believe it and accept it, as you're told the people of Israel did, choose this day whom you will serve. For for myself and my household, we choose the Lord. Now you choose, and they said, we choose the Lord. 
Now you are witnesses against yourself. You can't pass the buck from now on and say he is against me. You've chosen the Lord as the only Lord. Therefore you are witnesses against yourself. So tomorrow something doesn't go as it ought to go, as you think it ought to go. And then you look around for some scapegoat and you think, well now he is doing it, she is doing it, they are doing it. And the minute you begin to say they are doing it, you've forgotten your choice. For your choice was, I will serve the God of Israel. I'm only the God of Israel, and that God is I am. So you should ask yourself, what am I doing? Where did I go wrong in my assumption that I am the man, the woman that I want to be? If I want to be this, that, or the other, then I can't say I will be that. I must dare to assume I am that right now. And although at the moment reason denies it, my senses deny it, I must persist in this assumption. There is in one story told in, I'm not studying the book because it isn't available, it's not on the table tonight, The Law and the Promise. There are 40 case histories and everyone is based upon that simple choice of the God of Israel. I didn't mention the word God of Israel, but that is their choice. I am now living in my home, said the doctor. A lovely home with many units to rent, bringing in income. Allowing me my office and my space for my own personal life, and yet I have units bringing me in an income. And he didn't have a nickel, not one penny. His name is Dr. Moore. And a total stranger goes by and stops in, not to visit him as a doctor, to visit him as a potential client, for he was a builder. He had the money, he had the vision, and saw this empty lot. And he built it for Dr. Moore, without one penny out of Dr. Moore's pocket. Because Dr. Moore, at the time, was given to saving every penny he could for his old age, as he says. And couldn't venture into this, although he would like to do it. When he heard this, he said, cost me nothing to do this. I will simply sleep in the assumption that it's built. And he slept in the assumption that building was done. When a total stranger drives by and stops in and proposes the building and raises the money and completes the building and turns the key over to him. There isn't one of the 40 stories that is not based upon the choice of the God of Israel as our God. And that God is I am. So tonight, if you really know what you want in this world, and you're willing to take this God as the only God, don't turn to any other God, and then assume that I have it, or I am it, or I am it, whatever it is, and sleep as though it were true. May I tell you in a way that you cannot consciously devise, you will wake tomorrow under compulsion to move in certain directions. And no matter where you go, it may seem wrong, but on reflection, it will prove to be right. It was the thing you should have done. You'll meet this party, that party, the other party, and they will all add up to the fulfillment of your assumption. If you are faithful to the God of Israel. So when Joshua asked the question, and the word Joshua is the Hebraic word for Jesus. It was Joshua who led the people across the river into the promised land. Moses couldn't do it. He's buried in man as that power. Joshua comes out and does it. Joshua is your own wonderful I am. It's spelled just like Jehovah with a shin iron at the end of it for many marvelous reasons. If I take the name yod Hey vav Hey and analyze it for you, Yod is a hand, a creative hand. Hey is a window, the eye of the body. Vav is a nail. And the last one is a Hey. What I see internally, the first Hey, I will now so feel it, I will externalize it in my world. That's the yod Hey vav Hey. In the word Jesus, or Joshua, the same word, it's yod Hey, vav the same first three, 
but then shin iron. Shin is a tooth, as a symbol, and iron is an eye. The truth is that if I bring something into my world and I don't like it, I must have the power to destroy it or change it. If I have to live with all of my creations and I created when I didn't know better and I must live with them, I am living in hell. So a shin is inserted into the vein of the savior of the world where he brings it in, it's not as he wanted it to be, he can consume it. It's a fire, a three-pronged fire called a tooth. For the tooth is a symbol of that which crushes and consumes. It also is a flame. So the flame burns it and destroys it, that I may rebuild it into a better shape. So here we have this yod heh vav Shinayan, the name of Joshua, the name of Jesus. The same letters, yod heh vav Hey, in the name of Jehovah, which is I am. That's all that it means. So the whole thing is taking place in us as our own wonderful human imagination. And if you choose that God and no other God, you can't go wrong. This is the God. So I ask everyone here to put it to the extreme test. But if tonight you feel it may be wrong. Suppose I have chosen the wrong God. Suppose now he really is something external to myself. He hasn't taken up residence in me. He is something on the outside watching me and never has misled me to believe in my own wonderful human imagination. Then where am I then? I've gone astray from the God I formerly worship to a God he has proposed. But may I tell you, I know from experience the God of whom I speak. You will meet him one day, and strangely enough, although it's internal, you will see it standing before you as an external being. And it's infinite love. And it's articulate and speaks to you as another. For he will address you, and you will answer. The question asked, and yet the whole drama is taking place within you. And this God is infinite love. And he stands before you and asks you a very simple question. What is the greatest thing in the world? You will answer correctly. You will answer love. He will embrace you and you accuse and you are one person. And forever, you're still one person. This infinite being that stands before you is housed within you. He simply is awakening as you remain faithful to your choice to serve the God of Israel. So you make the decision. I either serve him or I don't serve him. If I serve him, I walk through here tonight in the assumption that I am already the man. I am already the woman that now this moment I want to be and try to the best of my ability to remain faithful to that tense I am and not say well I will be that eventually just I am and if you do it may I tell you you will become it in the not distant future so here this unalloyed being buried in man and one day you will see it it's pure unmixed complete, and you will see it as this tree is cleft in two from top to bottom. And looking at the base, you see the blood of God has set you free. And you, the imprisoned spirit in that tree, is now one with the blood, and up you go. And you are free of this age. But not one child in this world could live unaided by that sacrifice of the life of God. So when we read in the book of Blake, unless I die, thou canst not live. But if I die, I shall arise again, and you with me. And that's true. It's a voluntary act 
for he gives himself for us. Because you and I were subjected unto futility, not willingly. May I tell you, in my vision, no one wants to come here. No one. When I spoke of the stories of earth and told them of my experiences on earth, they wouldn't believe me. And Heine said to me, not one will believe you. They have not yet been subjected to this section of time. You have been subjected, and therefore it's a blessing. Because everyone who is subjected has told us in the scriptures, we were called, we were chosen. He called us in himself before the foundation of time. And having called us, he subjected us without our consent. And he came with us right into this world of death. And then having brought us here, those now that he foreknew, for he foreknew me, he foreknew you, he now predestines to be conformed to the image of his Son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. For how would he glorify me? Only with himself as told us in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. Now glorify thou me with thine own self. And so he glorifies him with himself and gives him fatherhood. For God is a father. And so here, everyone will reach that moment in time when God will glorify him. And that's the end. These are the five stages. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. And these are the five stages. And so you, I don't see how anyone can interpret these five terms that come to any conclusion other than predestination. Relative to that age. Everyone will be taken out of this age, though they may delay it by not quite keeping the tent. You have chosen the God of Israel as your God. You may delay the exit because you find it difficult to keep the tents. But you will still be taken out because you'll come back and back and back time and again to the true God. And finally you're taken out of this age into that age called the kingdom of God. So everyone who is here will be transported into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. It's an entirely different world. Isn't this world at all? But while we're in this world, we use God's principle, the same principle, and make our exit not from this age into that age, but from this state into that state. So we take states here. And so I'm in a state that isn't pleasant. Or I know a friend who is in a state that isn't pleasant. And so I represent him to myself as the man I would like him to be. I believe he's taking place now. So I am faithful to the God of Israel by saying, I am seeing it now. I am hearing it. I am continuing to hear it. And always I will hear because I'm doing it now. And he has to conform to what I am hearing as true of him. And so I'm moving from one state into another state. And from that state, after he's exhausted it, into a still other state. And that's how we move in this world of ours. So here tonight, the unalloyed of which I speak is that pure gold of God. This is blood that made you alive, for the life is in the blood. And were it not for that sacrifice, a voluntary sacrifice, you could not breathe in this world. So God himself entered death's door, always with those who enter. And this is death's door. And he lays down in a grave with them, in visions of eternity, until they awake. And when they awake, God and the one with whom he ended are one. For in the end there is only God. 
nothing but God. And his name forever and forever is I Am. So tonight, if you have any objective, I hope it is a great, noble objective, but any objective, do it in this simple, simple way. What would you see were it true? How would you see the world were it true? Well, then begin to see the world mentally as you would see it physically were it true. And go sound asleep in the assumption that what you are seeing mentally is physical fact. Just try it. What you actually see in mentally is physical fact. Here, my friend in the city, who teaches you throughout the year, he takes off for the time that I am here, and we are daily together. But the story I told of in, in the book, The Law and the Promise, when he goes in for a record, having seen exactly what he wanted, and the man said, we do not have it. And he replied mentally, not physically, the man didn't hear him, that's not what I heard you say. He was so sure that what he had imagined and heard mentally was fact that when it didn't have the echo to support it, he said inwardly, that's not what I heard you say. And then on the way out of the store, the man saw the record, took it off the shelf, and then said, oh, here, we do have it. The exact album that you want, the same artist interpreted it, and everything just as you wanted it. He thanked him, took it, and paid for it. But before he went off physically to the record shop, he simply enacted the scene. The scene which would imply the fulfillment of what he wanted in this world. Then he went and asked for it, and the man said, we don't have it. As he said to his friends who tried to get it for him for Christmas. And so here is a story based upon one's own wonderful creative act. And the creative act is your own wonderful human imagination. So I hope that you who wrote me the letter that I got this morning, I hope you're present. That this country, as our forefathers said, as Robert Frost stated that they said it, they did not believe in the future. They believed it in. The mere passage of time would not bring anything to America. You and I, citizens of America, who love it, we must believe our ideals in. We can't wait and hope that some star is shining who is going to do it for us. The minute you believe that some star, some constellation, or teacup leaves, or the card, or something else, has the future of our country in its hand, you have turned from the God of Israel. Choose this day whom you will serve. We choose the God of Israel. What is his name? I am. You choose that as your God? Yes. Now you are witnesses against yourself. From that moment on of your choice, you cannot turn to anyone and say, they are against me and they are making it impossible for me to realize my objective. The minute you do that, you are not serving the God of Israel. For the God of Israel is simply I am. There never was another to the God of Israel and never will be. All over the world, in spite of all the claims to the contrary, you do not find such a God. This is the one God in the extreme. You go to other religions, there are multiple gods. They all have unnumbered gods, but not the God of Israel. Monotheism began in that state. And Christianity is but the fulfillment of Judaism. The true Christianity. Where one not only believed it, it brings it to fulfillment. And all that was promised in the Old Testament unfolds within the individual who is faithful to the God of Israel. For he himself goes through every experience. Not the other one, but he himself. The birth the resurrection, all these things promised in the old, he as an individual experiences as I am. 
Who is resurrected? <coughs> God means I am. And all these things happen in the individual. So here, the God of Israel, forever and forever, is I am. Now then let's go into the silence. Now, are there any questions, please? Yes. How I go into meditation? The lady would like me to explain how I go into meditation. The first thing I do, I make myself very comfortable, physically, in an easy chair, or on the couch, or on my bed. I do not assume any uh, physical position that would strain my body and cause my attention to be thinking in terms of that pressure. I'm completely at ease as far as I'm concerned. I close my eyes and turn my attention within my skull. I find within a matter of seconds after my attention is turned in as though I'm observing the interior of my skull. The whole dark convolutions of the brain begin to grow luminous. And then it pulses. Golden liquid light begins to pulse on my head. You can observe it. It comes around this way. And then after a little while, you see it go off in sort of smoke screens, only golden liquid light. And then something may happen, and you'll have a vision. Not always the vision will come, but always the gold will come, and always the blue will come. In the midst of your forehead, you'll find a blue light, and the nearest thing on earth to describe it is alcohol lit. In other words, it's not a flame like gas. When my mother had plum puddings at Christmas, or for other occasions, and she would smother it with rum or brandy and light it, the flame would simply move like a living flame. It wasn't a, a fixed flame like gas. And this alcohol burning is a beautiful color. It's exactly like that, right in your head this way. Two shades of blue, and it's a, a moving, uh, turbulent thing, and it's blue. So the blue is within the band of gold. But I find it a very simple, simple process. Close your eyes, turn your attention on the inside, and just simply turn your attention into your skull. And you'll find a little blue light appearing here, and it's just like a little alcoholic flame burning. Because the whole thing moves. It's a moving, moving flame. And then it gets bigger and bigger. And may I tell you, if you open your eyes, which you may, you'll see the flame. Only, it will be enlarged based upon your focus. If you focus to the end of the room, the flame grows in proportion. If you bring it back, it's small. So you can see it with the eyes open or with them shut. But it comes when you close your eyes and the whole thing begins to unfold. Try it. You'll find this a fascinating thing. You don't? Well, my dear, this is now Wednesday night before Sunday. See if you can tell me that you do see it. Don't try to see it. Let it happen. We're all the same beings, there's only God in this world. Can you see an after image? For instance, can you look at this picture? Any picture. Just don't strain your eyes, just look at it. And then look elsewhere and see the after image of the picture with your eyes open? Well, all right, you start it. So you look at the picture. And all of a sudden, you turn from where the picture is, and you look over there. And everything is in complementary color. Everything, the blues aren't blue. They're sort of gold. The reds are sort of green, depending on the shade of the red. And they all move over, and they're all complementary. Not only that, you can just simply look at your thumbnail, having seen a good picture like that, and look at your thumb, and it's in miniature, the same picture. 
or look off into space, and it magnifies. So these are oh, images, sort of to show you that you're not altogether here. And I don't mean that in some uncomplimentary manner. That we are not altogether gathered together in this little garment of flesh. We are more than this. But you try this meditation, it's very simple. And it does not depend upon your eating meat or not eating meat. Or smoking or drinking or anything else in this world. Don't believe it. As you are told in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. Or rather, not Romans, it is Corinthians. That no one is by his food commended to God. That food cannot commend us to God. And we know worse off for not, and know better off for. So people give up these things, all right, let's give them up. But it doesn't depend upon anything you do physically. This world of the flesh remains flesh, and flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Any other questions, please? Thank you, I didn't know that. I'm not familiar with the technical side of cameras. Well, you, you're speaking from experience, and so I will accept it. I really don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I only know I can look at anything here, anything. And it takes me just a second to look at exit, look over here, and the whole thing is green. A green exit is over right there now. By looking at it, get an impression and you turn away, it's an apt image. In Barbados, where I was born, the sun, we have no sunsets. The sun goes down like this. We're almost on the equator. And you're sitting on the beach looking at the sun, and the sun is moving this huge orb of red. And suddenly you aren't seeing a red sun, you're seeing a green sun. But you're seeing a sun and it's green. The sun is gone. And you're looking at the apt image. You've been looking at the sun on the horizon, and the sun is moving rapidly, or it does, on the equator. It doesn't move any rapidly, but never to us it is. I'm sitting on the beach looking at the sun, and this huge orb of red, and suddenly it isn't red, it's green. But you are seeing the sun, you're seeing the apt image of the sun. The sun is gone. Because we have no twilight in the tropics, where I came from. My dear, you can do it and make it a constructive moment, or you can just simply wait for revelation. For revelation can't be conjured. It just happens. Vision come. You can't conjure it. But in applying this principle towards definite objectives in this world of Caesar, you do something about it. But that's not vision. Vision is something entirely different. Vision is really to be in a dream completely awake. It's completely awake. And it's a dream, as far as the world is concerned, but you're completely awake and everything is objective. Everything is real. Any other questions, please? Why is there fear? Well, my dear, you're very honest. The chances are that many people do feel fear. If you could only for one moment realize the being that is possessing you is God. And the Spirit of God took possession of Gideon. Means that the Spirit clothed itself with Gideon. So when you feel this vibration, you're being clothed. He uses you as a clothing. Go with it. Go with it. It's yourself. 
This doesn't make sense to the rational mind, because they can find the being of whom I speak by cutting open the skull. He isn't there. So when you feel the spirit possessing you, and you interpret it as a vibration, it is a vibration. It's a tremendous vibration. And you'll hear it as a wind. And the whole thing will possess you. And then you're taken. So go with it. First of all, you don't die anyway. Nothing dies. We don't want to lose the contact with our friends here, but we have to eventually. And may I tell you, we make our exit on cue. So don't be concerned. There are people living in our world who have abused the physical body from morning to night for 90 years. And they're still vegetating. And others watched every little morsel of food that they ate. And they were strict with themselves and perfect to the book. And so one morning, if you read the obituary, he was only 35. So his perfect little book and all that man knows about the human forms didn't keep him beyond 35. He got his cue. Who by taking thought could add one hour to his span of life. If you bear that in mind, you won't be anxious. If you know you can prolong it, you won't be anxious. And there are those who beat themselves to death and they can't seem to go. They are. They just won't go. Do you know of anyone, and I admire the man tremendously, do you know of anyone today who violated the code of health more than Churchill? Well, there's a man who smoked his 20 cigars a day, drank his two quarts of liquor a day, ate like a pig, And here, at 90, he finally could give up. And others who watched everything. I think of that story of uh, his general, when he said to him, you know, Mr. Churchill, I don't smoke and I don't drink. And some other thing he didn't do. Forget what it was now. And I'm 100% perfect, said he to Churchill. This is General Montgomery. And Churchill said to him, you know, I smoke excessively, drink excessively, or whatever the other thing was, that also excessively, and I'm 200% perfect. So Montgomery has a few more years to go to reach 90. He may reach 90, but he thinks that his attitude towards life is doing it. All right, let him do it. We come into this world on cue, we go on cue. It's a play, a beautiful play, and yet the most horrible play that ever was conceived. Conceived by God and played by God. The last chapter of Job tells you, and all of his brothers and his sisters and those who knew him came to comfort him for the evil that the Lord God had brought upon him. The Lord brought it upon him. Here is the most cruel experiment ever conducted on anyone. And who do you think, Jovi? You are. So in the end of your day, you have gone through all the trials of Job. But you will have much more for having gone through them. I try you in the furnaces of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. He can only give it to himself. So when you are in his eye perfect, or you fuse with his blood that he sacrificed, then you rise as God. One more. In an accident, you see, I am not a great follower of Freud, but Freud made that statement that there is no such thing as an accident. 
far as he was concerned, it was caused by the individual. That's what he said. But the Bible teaches that there is no accident. As a man sows, so does he reap. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. As a man sows, so he reaps. It's the most difficult thing for man to grasp. These innocent children in a bus accident, and they're all gone. All these boys now in Vietnam, and they're gone. And to believe for one moment, there is no accident. So we come back to Job. They all came and they comforted Job because of the evil that the Lord God had brought upon him. If you really accept this, you will not be as anxious as you normally would be. You will take things in stride. But all play the game and play based upon this principle, not forgetting your choice when you came here. You promised that you were going to serve the God of Israel. For coming to this world, that was your choice. And many have forgotten it. And they served all kinds of gods. They turned to astrology, turned to numerology, turned to everything outside of God. But you here, I hope that you haven't turned to other gods. And that you will faithfully follow the one God. There's only one God. He's residing in you as I am. And all things are possible to that God. Good night.